I kind of think that if 200 to 250 million people really wanted to embody the way of Jesus in our nation, our nation and our society would be completely different, would it not? So what that tells me is that we are 200 or 250 million people. I am identifying myself with that, with that people group. We are 250 million people who say we believe something, but it doesn't really affect the way we live and engage with the rest of the world around us. I'm wondering, friends, this year, as we reflect on the cross together and sing how great the Father's love and we'll come and partake in the Eucharist together. I'm wondering if you're willing, if we're willing as a community together to just try to be shaped and transformed by these stories this weekend. To do something different than just observing. But saying, I want to live and be shaped by the cross. I want to live out the resurrection. So this evening, I can't see exactly what time it is, but I'm not going to go long. I've got two things that I want to highlight on the way to the cross, one on the way to the cross and one on the cross. And I want to see what we can learn from them. And then we're going to release you out of these doors in about 25 minutes. And I'm wondering if you'd be willing to sit in this story a little bit longer on your own. Wondering if you're, you'd be willing to take a walk tomorrow or sit in quiet in that liminal Holy Saturday and reflect and come together and see if we could be transformed by these stories. So the first thing that I want to look at tonight as we're together and see, engage in this narrative is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Now Jesus had celebrated the, the Last Supper with his disciples, and he's, he's taking this, even this opportunity where he's right before he's about to suffer and be mocked and humiliated and die, he's still teaching his disciples. He's taking this moment to teach about what it, the kingdom is like. He, the master, is doing what at the Lord's, at the Last Supper? Louder washing his disciples' feet. It's disgusting. I'm not a foot person. <laughs> Especially in the ancient Near East, there was all sorts of things on those roads. I'm not kidding. Archaeologists say that we couldn't handle being alive during the ancient Near East in the, these times just because of the stench that was everywhere on the streets of Jerusalem, a city like Jerusalem. And God incarnate puts on the clothes of a slave and bends down and washes these feet of his followers who are more often than not totally dense to the ways of the kingdom. That's love. And he gives this 11th commandment this is Jesus saying, I am God, just so you know. Yes, I have the power to give an extra commandment. A new commandment, Jesus said. Do you remember this? A new commandment I give you. What is it? Love one another. Jesus, as he's facing down the most traumatic thing any of us could ever think about, is inviting his disciples to live in this way of love, to not just believe in it, but to embody and be shaped by it, to live it out. The invitation that I'm giving you is the one that Jesus is giving his disciples 2,000 years ago. And then as Jesus is done with the Last Supper and he tells Peter, just so you know, you are going to bail on me. You're going to be confronted, and there's going to be a moment of truth, and you are not going to answer the bell, buddy. Peter's horrified by that thought. And then they go to the Mount of Olives in the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus had come down from the Mount of Olives in the triumphal entry. He goes up into, in a very different fashion, 
is Matthew 26, verse 36. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. It was a garden. And he said to them, sit, there, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and two sons of Zebedee, James and John, along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Listen to these words. Take these in. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. What is Jesus facing? My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch for me, with me. Going a little farther, he fell on his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. We all know the story. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh, it's weak. And he went, to his, went away a second time to, and prayed, My father, if it is po not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and play, prayed for the third time, saying the same thing. I don't want to do this. But it's not about what I want. And he returned to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come. The Son of Man is delivered into the hand of sinners. Rise, let's go. Here comes my betrayer. The invitation for us, friends, is could we be shaped by this story? Could we be transformed as a people? by the story. And if we're going to be transformed by the story, I think we need to observe how, how Jesus handled himself as he faced this intense moment of crisis. How Jesus responded again. Ian walked us through really graphically and really well through what Jesus is about to face. Being arrested by the powers that be the God of the universe being arrested and betrayed by a kiss and then interrogated over and over and shifted around from, from one powerful person to the next powerful person to the next powerful, powerful person. And then his, his judgment is final and he's going to be executed. And he's, if you remember the story, he's sat down by these Roman soldiers, these evil oppressors who are just having fun with beating the life out of him, putting a crown of thorns on his head and smashing it into his head, smashing him with a staff over and over and over again. And he's, as he's about to face this torture, this humiliation, this mockery, what does he do? He shows this utter dependence on the Father. As Jesus is, is walking into this crisis moment, he says, I need some time with the Father. And so he goes away and prays and pleads with God and gets honest with the Father. We've been in a moment of crisis in our world, have we not? Do you remember Good Friday two years ago? I do. We're all looking at computer screens, trying our best to do this. And just think of all that's gone on since two years ago, Good Friday, and here and now. The crisis moments that we've faced as a people. How many times have we not answered the bell in this crisis as a people? If Jesus, if we're going to be transformed at all by the cross, Jesus is calling us to follow him in this utter dependence on the Father 
in these moments of crisis. And it didn't just happen just like that. It happened because Jesus had habitually built in this rhythm of retreating in prayer and dependence on God over and over and over again. If you know the Gospels, you know how Jesus will hide away when the things get intense and go off alone in prayer. Are we going to be transformed by the story this year? Or are we just going to be observers? How have you responded to this crisis, this two-year-long crisis? Have you grown in utter dependence on God and in prayer? Or have you moved to other things to cope? We're going to be transformed by the cross. We need to be transformed by how Jesus walked into the cross. And then I could give a bunch of different examples through this story of how we might be transformed by this story of the crucifixion of Christ, this pinnacle moment in history. But I only have time for one more, and we're going to go directly to the cross, the death of Jesus. This is in John 20. I'm sorry, John 19. John 19, verse 28. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished and so scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. Wait, nope, sorry, wrong text. It's Luke. We went over this today too, Shelley. I couldn't remember. Luke 23, starting in verse 26. The soldiers led Jesus away. They seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. It's similar to where Jesus said if, if somebody asked you to walk a mile with them in the Sermon on the Mount, go the extra mile. The soldiers could do this. They could just grab any person on the side of the road and say, hey, carry my gear. Or in this case, carry this guy's cross. It's a normal thing. They made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed Jesus, including women who mourned and wailed with him. Jesus turned and said to them, daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. This is one of those things that we could learn from be transformed by as Jesus is, is marching to his death and execution. He's not even thinking about himself. Daughters of Jerusalem, do not mourn and weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, blessed are the childless woman, the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, fall on us and to the hills cover us. For if people do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two other men, both criminals, were also let out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, Golgotha, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. And here it is. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. When they divided up his clothes by casting lots, the people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if, if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself, man. There was a written notice above him that said, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said. Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly for what we are getting. We are getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you'll be with me in paradise. Jesus has been utterly humiliated by the religious leaders who are a bunch of corrupt hypocrites. Jesus has been beaten and humiliated by the Roman oppressors, the empire. And now he's walked to this place called Golgotha, the place of the skull, and crucified like a criminal. And the whole city is there to watch and be humiliated, pretty much naked, hanging on a cross. 
and in this moment. What is Jesus saying? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. See, Jesus talked a good game, didn't he, when the disciples came to him and asked him, Jesus, how many times should we forgive? And seven times, trying to impress him, and Jesus said, nice try. Try 77 times seven. In other words, unending forgiveness. There is no end to what I'm calling you, how many times I'm calling you to forgive those who've wronged you. Or Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, do you remember we were studying this last summer, and he said, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. I was talking last night to a uh, New Testament scholar, uh, brilliant, one of, the, one of the more brilliant New Testament scholars that around right now, I would say, and he was talking about he knew people who were being murdered by ISIS in the Middle East probably five years ago. And as we were talking about this way of Jesus, he said, I had a moment when I was hearing about my friends that were being tortured and murdered, I, I, I had this moment where I thought, Gee, the way of Jesus is not practical. And I'm not even sure I believe it should be carried out sometimes. That's, this is a biblical scholar. How many of us have had that same thought? Turn the other cheek. Love your enemy. And Jesus shows just how practical it can be as he's being humiliated and mocked and tortured and murdered, executed. He speaks these words of forgiveness on those who are standing there doing it. Showing us this can be done, friends. Inviting us into this way of forgiveness. When you talk about enemies, our world is full of them, aren't, isn't it? I know I'm not just talking about Russians and Ukrainians, but how many enemies have you, how many people or people groups or, or, or political groups have you obsessed over in the last couple of years? Am I the only one? Like, think about a couple of people, maybe that just took, you just went down these rabbit trails mentally, of humiliating them, of arguing with them. How many arguments have you had with people in your mind in the last couple of years? How many more enemies do you have? How many people have we lost at this church? And Jesus is saying, I'm asking you to sit here now and not just believe in this story, but I'm asking you, are you willing to live it out? To be a people of profound, profuse, unbelievable forgiveness. And it's not just the forgiveness that's astounding in the statement to me. It's the way Jesus sees the people who are murdering him. Do you see it? Did you get that? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. It seems like Jesus can see through all of the hatred, all of the bitterness that's targeted at him, all of the, all of the insecurity and anger and all the ugliness, and he can see through to the tender soul of the child he created. And he's interceding for those he's, who, who are murdering him. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. I think Jesus is interceding for you and I on a daily basis and saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And as he's interceding for us, saying, Father, forgive them, there's more to them than that. Jesus is also inviting us to live out this way of 
forgiveness and seeing the people around us, instead of seeing them for their bitterness towards us or their hatred or their, or their, or their, their, their isolation, leaving us the, the way that they've gone mad, Jesus tonight is inviting us to see people the way Jesus does. Two hundred and fifty million people say they believe in this Jesus that we're remembering tonight. What if those two hundred and fifty million, us included, embodied this kind of gospel? Anybody familiar with the term cruciform? I got two, three short hands up. Cruciform is something that's been shaped into the shape of a cross. Cathedrals in the ancient and medieval world were cruciform. They were built in a cruciform way. If you look from above an, a cathedral in Europe, you'll find it shaped like a cross. They built the whole thing, a sanctuary that's, that's long and, and narrow, and then it builds out, and then the, the, this area right here occupies at the top of the cross. It's shaped like a cross. It's built in a cruciform way. Swords in the ancient and medieval world were, were formed in a cruciform way. They looked like a cross, ironically. In the design world, there are cruciform things. Being shaped like a cross. Genesis 1 says that you and I bear the image of God. You were created to look like God and to radiate God to a world, the world around you. You bear the image of God. Well, what does God look like? He looks like that right there. People have been wondering for thousands of years what God is like, friends. And on that Good Friday, 2,000 years ago, we found what God is like. He's self-sacrificial to the end. Full of agape love, saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. Could we, friends, be a cruciform people? If you want to bear the image of God and grow in the likeness of Christ, this is what it looks like. To be transformed, not just observe the crucifixion of Jesus, but to be transformed by it. To live out the way of the cross, to live a cruciform life. This is a lot to ask. But it's not me doing the asking, I'm just the messenger. Jesus is saying, would you not just observe it this year? Would you be willing to embody it? And so Jesus, we, I ask, for tonight, for this commemoration of your death on the cross, your sacrifice, would you let it mold and shape me in ways that I need it so profoundly? Would you help me not just to believe in the cross, but to live it out? Would you inspire 250 million people who call themselves by your name to embody the way of the cross? Thank you for praying for us, for interceding for us, for offering us forgiveness over and over and over again when we get it wrong. Thank you for the new life that we have in your death, Jesus. Thank you for that we've been set free from sin, that we are no longer ruled by it, but we've been given freedom and liberation from it. Would you help us walk out of those chains? And so now, friends, we're going to Partake in the Eucharist together, the Lord's Supper. We're going to remember 
this sacrifice of Christ in a really interesting, symbolic way that Jesus told us to do right before his death. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 said, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The night the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and broke it, and he gave it to his disciples and said, Eat of this. This is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after, after the meal, he, gave, he took the cup and he said, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then Paul said this, For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. So friends, a lot of times I'm talking about proclaiming the Lord's death to the world around us who needs it so desperately, but here's the deal. Tonight, I'm going to be taking this bread and this cup to proclaim the Lord's death to myself. You do what you want, but for me, I need a proclamation of the sacrifice of Christ to just renew me, to nourish my soul, not my body. And so we're going to invite you up. We're going to have two people serving. We have these COVID-friendly communion situation where it's going to be in one little pack. And if you haven't been with us before, you try to peel and you watch me. It's going to take me like a minute and a half to get that top plastic off. But you, try, you peel the top off, and there's a wafer there of the bread, the body of Christ. And then you peel the second layer back, and the juice is there as well. Let's hold on. to. Let's wait to drink the, the cup until we can do that together, until everyone's gone. So when you, when you come up, come up the center aisle, take it and go down, back down the side aisle. And come, come to the table whenever you're ready. So friends, together, let's peel back that layer. Let's pray. Jesus, would you, you do some, you ask us to do some silly symbolic things, and this table is one of them. Because you're interested in forming and shaping us into a people like the cross. And so Jesus, as we eat meals every day, two, three meals a day to nourish our bodies, we eat this meal now to nourish our souls. To ask you in supernatural ways, Holy Spirit, would you come transform us? 
would you change the world through your cross? Would you transform our nation through the cross? And would you do it through us? In Jesus' name, let's drink the cup together. And let's stand and sing. Wherever you've been, come broken hearted, let rescue begin. Come find your mercy, oh sinner, come kneel. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal. So lay down your Amen. Thank you so much, you guys, for being here tonight. It's such a pleasure and such an honor uh, to be here with you. Just a reminder, we have um, Easter Sunday services at 10 a.m. this Sunday. Be here for that. It is going to be a party. Seriously, invite people, friends, neighbors, coworkers, anybody who wants to party. They should come here at 10 a.m. on Sunday morning. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, I can't wait to worship with all you guys. Uh, 
with that, I will give us our benediction for tonight. And so um, I bless you now as you leave here. I bless you to be thoroughly and truly transformed by the cross of Christ. That in his death and his resurrection, you have life. And that that becomes a reality that you can taste, that you can touch and see and feel every day. I pray these things in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, you guys. Have a, have a good night and happy Easter to all of you.